Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. This week we continue our retrospective on Atomic Age Horror with the 1955 giant bug movie Tarantula, directed by the great Jack Arnold, starring John Agar, Mara Corday, and the one and only Leo G. Carroll. Bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of horror fans who have seen it, so warning, spoilers ahead. From Denver, Colorado, I'm your host, Jason Henderson, co-author of California Tiki, coming this August from the History Press. With me from Austin is Tony Savaggio, tech director at Rooster Teeth, lead singer and bassist of the band Deserts of Mars, and lead guitarist of the band Rise from Fire. Say hello, Tony. Howdy. Howdy. Also in Austin is Mr. Drew Edwards, creator of the long-running indie comic Halloween Man, and coming July 4th from Comixology and Sugar Skull Media, the brand new Lucy Chaplin Science Starlet. I love that name. Say hello, Drew. Hello, Drew. Hello. <laughs> And and it's, just, proud. <laughs> yeah. it's just it's just because Julia is not with us. Yes, the uh, um and from the Rio Grande Valley, Professor David Bowles has received awards from the American Library Association, the Texas Institute of Letters, and the Texas Associated Press to the dozen books he's written. He's just recently added Feathered Serpent, Dark Heart of Sky, Myths of Mexico, and the YA steampunk graphic novel Clockwork Grandera. Say hello, David. Howdy. Come howdy. Down. Howdy. Howdy. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, more than more than one of us can say howdy in a in a podcast episode? I think we've done I, you, you, you know, I think we just violated the terms of the podcast. It must self destruct now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tony's lawyers will be sending you a cease and desist letter. <laughs> my yeah, my team of This is my last appearance. <laughs> my final appearance. <laughs> Castle of Horror. It's it's funny to me, David, that that you're one of our pinch hitters. Um and and we've got a couple of pinch hitters and there's even been times when it was like you and Adam, right? But right, I, mean, I remember I think that. that you've been pinch hitting since like I want to say like 2012 or something. I mean like a long time. You know, I I I've actually lost track of when we actually started doing this show, but I know that you've been showing up on it for a long time. I will uh, continue showing up whenever you guys need me. I'm I'm here for you. We we should do an episode where it's David, Jamie, and Adam, and it's like the 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 like when it's when, just the, when the, the, the yeah that's a wonderful yeah idea. it's like it's when the Fantastic Four have to be made up of of you know replace like the new Fantastic Four when it was the Wolverine, Ghost Rider, and uh, Hulk and Spider Man yeah or Justice Society yes yes <laughs> that's actually a fabulous fabulous idea we could just all not be on it and just have like you know whoever whoever draws the short straw can host you know Do you remember because... that that star trek episode called lower decks remember that one from the, yes. from the next generation uh, yeah. where it was just like all the ensigns and whatever that was a great episode i mean actually it is a wonderful episode yeah, yeah. just like um assistant editors month used to be a really great time of the year when it um in marvel comics uh okay tarantula is a 1955 American black and white science fiction giant monster film from Universal Pictures about science gone wrong, essentially. This is yet another movie where uh, radioactive experimentation has caused giantism in creatures, uh, except for that in this case, the giantism is caused by uh, experiments that are being done by a fairly benevolent professor named Leo G. Carroll, and the experiments he's doing are being investigated by the stalwart uh, doctor from town played by John Agar. So that's Tarantula. Uh, Drew, I know that you're the one who asked that we do this Atom Age horror. Do you say Atom Age or Atomic Age? I alternate. Yeah, okay. So I've been there saying is, Atomic there is Age. No, <laughs> there is no right or wrong. Tomato, we'll, tomato. We'll stick to it. So you said let's do an, an Atomic Age horror set, and I, I'm loving it. And we're about to go from big bugs into, like, personal monsters. So that's going to be really cool. But uh, why don't you tell us what is the deal with Tarantula? And then uh, we'll hear from David, some brief opening thoughts, Tony, and then I'll just take us into the discussion of the movie itself. Drew, uh, Tarantula, opening thoughts. Well, um, as I was saying before we started recording, this is a Them ripoff. This is a movie that was basically made because the movie Them, which we did several weeks back now, was very popular. Uh, it's done by Jack Arnold, who did, uh, it came from outer space, uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon, Creature Walks Among Us, uh, Monster, 
Monster on the Campus and uh, The Incredible Shrieking Man basically deserves a lot of credit for some of the better 50s sci-fi and monster pictures. I, I, I've seen him referred to as the the Terrence Fisher or James Whale of this genre, and I think mm. that is appropriate. Um, so it's actually a really good them knockoff. I don't think it's as good as them, but as far as like the the sort of uh, big bug pictures that came out in reaction to that, I think this is definitely the best one or one of the best ones. It's got a beautiful, you know, southwestern setting. It's mm-hmm. got a really good, fun uh, B movie cast. I, 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 I even kind of, even though they look hokey by today's standards, I like the the way you know the special effects done with the with the matting and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, just a fun, fun movie. And I think the thing that really sets this above a lot of the other movies that came out as a, to kind of rip off them or ripping ripping off sounds mean but you know like inspired by them or you know made in the wake of them i think the thing that sets this up above above a lot of those other ones is i love the small town characters in this movie i think i think this movie has very well drawn characters characters that i can believe in their relationships I love all the the business of the small town people and the way they interact with the characters in the movie. It's a fun movie. It's a delight to watch. I am glad that we we were able to work it in um, because I think it's 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 a it's a kind of a loaded thing to say, but it's a classic of its type. If mm-hmm. if, if if that is permittable, that's wonderful. Okay, that that definitely kicks us off, uh, David. I mean, uh, what are your what are your thoughts? I think the last time you were here. We were talking about another uh, film from the mid-century. We were talking about the 1960s Queen of Blood, right? So, right, yeah. so now we're diving about exactly 10 years before that. Uh, what are your opening thoughts on Tarantula? Well, I really liked it a lot. Um, obviously, you know, it's you know, it's it's a B film, and and there are some things about it that are you know not quite uh, up to par with, as Drew said, them and other of those more. Um, you know, stellar, um, big budget films, but there's a lot to love in it. Um, uh, the, the script is pretty cool. Uh, mm-hmm. At some point I want to talk about some of the quotes as connect to like, I, I guess a couple of the, the major <clears throat> characters. There was some, some stuff I, I came away, um, you know, thinking about and, and, uh, and that's what you want. I mean, it, it doesn't beat you over the head with its message, but there's definitely, um, you know, some, some exploration, some ethical exploration of of science and um, and its intersection with human existence and our future and so forth. So there there are a lot of uh, fun things in there of the whole. I wouldn't say mad scientist variety, but the science gone awry science being used mm-hmm. ostensibly for the good of humanity and 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 what happens when it when it goes awry. And I like it was it was relatively um, you know fast paced for a film of its time in an hour. It years. is so, yeah. Um, it zips it zips by um uh, as as drew has mentioned there's great great characters the small town setting the southwest and its beauty and it's you know lurking evil um as as dr matt um hastings talks about at one point um is is on display and so visually it was a really really compelling uh, film as well so I, I i had never seen it before or if i'd seen it it'd been i must have been like a child and so i didn't remember it very much at all Although I mean, everybody has probably seen clips from it. You know, the tarantula coming over yeah. the, the piles yeah. of, of rock. And so well, forth. But um, I, I I was happy to see it. It was, a, it was a wonderful way to spend my afternoon. Very cool, uh, Tony. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I like the film a lot. I've seen it a couple of times before this, uh, probably on Monster Theater or something similar. Um, but it had been a really long time. Um, Definitely not as good as them. Uh, Definitely it's a knockoff movie. Um, And, you know, it's also not nearly as progressive as them uh, from a feminist standpoint either. It really takes a step back, you know, to the point where I still think there's, it's interesting, you know, they have a, you know, a female scientist, but they decided to name, you know, well, 
you don't want to do too much. Her, you know, we'll call her Steve for the yeah. rest of the movie. And there's She'll just feel a, like lot a, boy of, a <laughs> lot of very 50s stuff that there was some of in then, but really is a step backwards in that respect in this movie. Um, and But I, I like the setting. There's a lot of great character actor bits as well. The sheriff is great. Uh, Josh, the guy who runs the hotel desk that uh you know the doctor works works in and is a really great character actor uh there's a lot of great bits um and again the science part of it like what they're trying to do and how that all ties in is actually really interesting and there's some really fantastic bits um with the scientist that is uh trying to do what he's trying to do um, and he's a great actor as well you can tell like he's has a very has a lot of gravity when he's when he's there um yeah but yeah i, I like the i like the movie a lot just not as good as them <laughs> Definitely. So I probably felt it was even closer to them than you guys might have. I mean, thinking back on them, there was a lot of really neat stuff about government paranoia and, 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 you know, all that stuff that was really interesting, like with the Fess Barker character uh, and the fact that the, the female scientist in that one was absolutely on par with everybody else and ordering people around. All true. Having said that, I really enjoyed this movie a lot. You know, I thought that it went, first of all, it goes super fast. It's only about 90 minutes long. Maybe that's an exaggeration. If it's, if it's longer than 90 minutes, I didn't feel it. It, it goes. No, it's like it's, 80 minutes. Yeah. yeah it's is like it? Minutes, yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, it's, it's a fast movie and uh, I'm looking that up. Yeah, you're right. It's 80. Well, that explains a lot. I mean, it, you're barely into it and then it's over by modern standards. Uh, Nestor, <laughs> Nestor Paiva. Uh, who plays I Lucas in the uh, in um, the creature from Black Lagoon is here as the sheriff. As the and, sheriff, what a oh, that guy! That guy is priceless. He is He's priceless. Great. You know, and and I think get, you know. In fact, let's just start talking about the world, and then let's talk about director Jack Arnold. So first of all, the world of this movie. Uh, just like with uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, is a small town. In this case, it's a small town that's you know liter- out out in the desert. So the doctor has such a gigantic area that he caters to that he gets around in a little plane, and uh, the sheriff is driving all over. You know, probably what in in other towns would be like multiple multiple counties, and everybody knows one another. And it just it teaches me so much about you know, how you would people such a, such a creation with, you know, characters. And, and the beginning of it is humor. You know, all of those characters need to be sort of sassing one another all the time and, and, and sort of, you know, demonstrating, you know, like how, how different they are. It's a wonderful setting. Well, that, that really, to me, felt, as, as somebody who grew up in a small town, that feels very real because there's a chumminess yeah. that develops when, when you know, you're in a small town and you go into the various shops and, you know, everybody knows everybody. So they, they, they get that way with their customers and even yeah. the, the police will will be that way you don't have that in a big city and you know like the police are driving around with like the the local reporter and 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 it's just like perfectly normal and no one's like there's right right absolutely um yeah it's it's a really neat setting and when you think about the fact that I, i was thinking about like what if you're a person watching this you know, you're a person in Brooklyn watching it in 1955 or, or person in Dallas, Texas or whatever. It's it's not only, you know, you, you paid your money because you went in to see a giant tarantula. But what you end, what you see for a lot of it is a movie about another small town in another part of America from where you are, most likely. You know, and it just is fascinating to me. I always I often think about the audience member, you know, like just a guy with his family or or or, or a girl with with, uh, you know, with her girlfriends or with her boyfriend or whatever. And, you know, you're watching and like, what are they what are they taking in? What are they learning from all this? And well, I, I, I just well, love these little American towns. Yeah, yeah, I hope when I was watching it, I kept thinking this the screenplay and the director are, are so, so very smart because you the, the tarantula is not going to come onto the screen until like, you know, halfway through the film and, and it's kind of being expensive. So it's not going to show up very often. So what we, what you need is to like care about the town and care about the people in it. So there's a real sense of menace as the tarantula gets closer to the town. And I thought that that was really, really well done. Like I was enamored of the people in the town 
and didn't want anything to happen to them. And so even though I'm watching a film yeah. from, you know, 63 years ago, I, yeah. as the tarantula started, you know, encroaching upon the town, that scene where they're in the street and they're looking and here it comes. I'm like, oh, fuck, <laughs> somebody do something about this goddamn tarantula. Yeah, something, do something about it. destroy this wonderful little town. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's it's so strange to me that that this is something that we would say goodbye to like the anxiety is being expressed in this movie small town what's going to happen to the people that i know and love or at least that i know really well whether i like them or not you know they're under threat when invasion of the body snatchers gets remade in 1978 they no longer find the small town idea uh meaningful and and instead they move it to san francisco you know, and I, I'm i not completely certain. I mean, there has to be a meaning there. You know, the, the, when I think of yeah. movies made in the 70s, they're all urban, right? You know, it's it's the, the sort of grimy life of, of Rocky and everything. Yeah, so the faithlessness I, of, the, of this mass of humanity shoved into right. the city. Well, the funny and, thing and, is... and nowadays it's about the spectacle. Like nowadays if they remade Tarantula, you just... You know that even if it began in a small town, the tarantula would get to a big city because people want to see shit get smashed up. And so, you yeah. Know. Well, they yeah. kind of did remake tarantula. They did eight legged eight legged freaks, which is oh yeah, essentially a campy knockoff of of this. Um, I, I good question. I hmm. I think the the reason why you started to see the shift away from this sort of small town genre setting is be, because of actually the sort of thing that they were commenting on in Invasion of the Body Snatchers that sort of idea of conformity in the 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 small town America kind of became especially the small town America of the 1950s kind of became you know symbolic yeah. of that and you know, of course, you know, this this small town is very different than the small town in Invasion of the Body Snatchers. This small town is delightful. And so it's like you have one yeah, film that's that's showing you the dark side of what living in a small town can be like in this town. And, you know, you have the, the parts about it that are good and are pleasant. And both of them are true. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. You know, neither one of them is wrong. Like as somebody who spent a good portion of my life in a small town, I can tell you there's truth in both of these films yeah. um, and, and they both resonate with me in different ways. Um, it is kind of funny, like Stephen King is really the only one that's really ho- carrying the torch for sort of setting uh, his genre stories in small towns, at least in a, a mass market kind of way. The only the only example I can think of that, that you know the scream movies all take place in a in a college town in a little college town uh so there's that but the, but there hasn't you know but they've been sort of far and few between um yeah i, I don't know you know i think that there was a big shift you know it's not like people stopped living in small towns by the way because you and i were not li- we're not kids in the 50s and and small towns are still small towns but i mean if you think like what have we talked about that took place in a small town? The Stepford Wise, 1975, the whole idea there was leave the big city and go find the traditional values of the small town, only to find out that small towns have been thoroughly corrupted by, by you know, essentially... But- wouldn't you, you say know. that's a little more of a comment on on like suburbia and like you know the, the yeah that's white true. flight to because, suburbia? Yeah, it is. It is because he was appalled by the liberalism of the big city, and so yeah. he goes to a. You're right. It's a suburb. It's not quite a small town. This is an honest to god small town. There is no bigger city that is like. No. Is like you have to fly to right Phoenix, there. basically. Yeah, <laughs> and, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Which is yeah. Yeah, what he does. Yeah, what he does at some point. The, yeah, it's a it's a world that's gone. I know that it sounds like we're belaboring this point, but I, I just find it fascinating that this is the world that that uh, that a lot a lot of these movies are placing these giant monsters into. Um, and I think it also has to do with the great awareness on the part of, again, thinking of the girl taking her little brother to the movies in Brooklyn, you know, we're aware that we're blowing up atomic bombs out in the desert. And yeah. what is that about? And what's that like? And so well, I think there's also an interesting connection. So, I mean, if, if the, the main thrust, I know you're going to get to the, the plot in a second, but the, the main thrust of the science is yeah. uh, population growth. Um, we're going to, you know, run out of food. We need to have a yeah. synthetic way um, to 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 put to place this in the deserts 
where there's yeah. a scarcity of, you know, of, of food and, and, and have livestock that are, you know, that we kind of like artificially um, keep alive through like, you know, shipping in hay and stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's really kind of ingenious because it underscores the kind of, um, you know, delicate balance that there is between human Absolutely. beings in, in, in our biosphere. Also, there's some plot stuff. I mean, if you want to hide, hiding out in the desert, is where to go. You yeah, know, they're yeah. hiding. They're hiding the experiments. There's also, you know, with all the atomic testing in the desert, it it's exotic for a lot of the country. Oh, there we did those things out there, um, and it also, you know, adds to the, uh, you know, the idea of difference, and it appeals to. So, you, so you're gonna get if if I were making this movie, perhaps you know the director never thought of it past. Hey, I need to have a town that's isolated. Because I, you know, it'd be easy to discover a giant tarantula in a city. <laughs> you know, it's not going to yeah. sneak up on anybody. But if you want to dig deeper into it, you can say, well, there's a certain, and King uses this a lot, there's a certain charm to the small town uh, pluckiness and togetherness, um, in addition to the kind of darker side that, you know, Drew pointed out. Um, yeah. So you're, you have an exotic thing for people living in the city, and you have a, yeah, that's right. That's how small towns take care of things for the people who live in a small town. Yeah. You know, all, all of this is framed by everything's exotic once giant bugs and beasts yes. start happening. <laughs> I, I, I was, you know, I was looking up something. I, and I kind of have an idea of it, but I really wonder why it was that once we had atomic bombs, why was it that gigantism seemed to be the end result of these nuclear tests and i know it's because they you know they did see like a larger mutant things um but in general that seems to be a trend that happened a lot and i'm curious uh i didn't see any real good articles but maybe i wasn't looking hard enough on why is gigantism the result of radiation across so many movies and in the mindset of the people of the time i'm fascinated by that yeah it's a really I, good question i, I don't I think i've never thought because about it. i think it's because it's emulating the level of destruction that an atomic bomb could do i mean that that's that's godzilla in a nutshell right, right. right there you know it's 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 really you know you're putting a face on the bomb effectively <laughs> And, you know, obviously, if you take an animal that people already think is creepy, be it a lizard or, in this case, a tarantula, and you make it bigger, well, you have four times the, the creep factor. Right. So, I, I but I, I really do think that this idea of, of gigantism and all that, it, it really was about putting a face on the atomic bomb, putting a face on the mushroom cloud, you know, putting it in something that we could understand. But, you know, Arnold did play around with the reverse of this when he did The Incredible Shrinking Man. Yeah, so, such a fantastic uh, movie. Yeah. yeah. In The Incredible Shrinking Man, he gets exposed to a cloud of radiation that just, just sort of overwhelms his boat. You know, and what's so depressing about that, and all of this is so informed by, you know, Americans' awareness of radiation sickness and poisoning, you know, and training and PSAs about all that and the bullshit idea that you might be able to survive it. Everybody had an idea it was bullshit. And in Incredible Shrinking Man, he just drifts into a cloud and that ruins his life, you know. And and, and here, um, Leo G. Carroll, everybody who is working on this stuff, you know, forget the giant tarantula. What happens to the humans who are exposed to this experiment? Again, as David says, they're doing the experiment for good things. They want to like, they want to be able to fight a coming food shortage that they imagine will happen. But uh, well, they're imagining it. Oh, the funny thing is, is also he's talking about food shortage starting around the time that we're all discussing this movie. He says like 2016, I yes, believe. Right, and yeah. we there are hugely food insecure parts of the world but the straight Malthus thesis has not quite worked out the way people imagined you know it, instead what's happened is that we figured out ways to be hyper efficient in making highly caloric foods that are not particularly nutritious and then we've got lots of food deserts but so it hasn't worked out the way that they predicted but anyway the the what's terrible is that you know, Leo G. Carroll and his assistants all developed this horrible, horrible bone swelling 
that ultimately ends up suffocating them to death. It is an ugly thing and presented with a great deal of gravity in, you know, people would call this a B-movie. I'm never even quite sure exactly why anymore, but that's handled pretty darn well. You know, this, and, and... They, called it, they called this a B-movie isn't, I mean, it is, but it's not entirely accurate. This isn't... You know, back way back um, when we did um, Lost Skeleton of, of Cadaver, we we had yeah. a lot of talk about the sort of movies yes. that that movie is parroting. Once again, this is not that. This is right. not a so bad it's good movie. <laughs> Universal Studios. By the way, Mega Topic Two will be uh, that particular YouTube video. We can send them to about so bad it's good. After we're done talking about uh, this movie. Uh, we're, I'm going to take a little, carve out a little bit of time for us to talk about that because I think it's fascinating. Anyway, continue. So, uh, this is this is not that. This, yeah. this you know, Jack okay, Arnold, anyway, Jack Arnold is... knew, knew, knew how to shoot a movie. Yeah. What's Go weird? Ahead, I'm sorry, me, Tony. What were you going to say? What's weird to me is the you know anybody who's a, any human who's exposed to this gets acromegaly, which they call they they keep calling it acromegalia, which mm-hmm. I've only seen. I had to look it up because I'm like, have I had it wrong all these years? Uh, my mom, you know, was got her degree in microbiology and so, you know, taught anatomy and physiology. So it was one of the things we discussed. Uh, Richard Keel, Jaws, uh, mm-hmm. had acromegaly, Andre the Giant. Um, they think maybe Lincoln could have had. There's mm-hmm. theories about that. I don't think it was ever seriously proven. Um mm-hmm. Even they, you know, some scholars have said, hey, if Goliath had acromegaly, that would mean that would be why he was able to be killed by a stone because your your skull is could be thinner, for example. Yeah. But they yeah. keep calling it acromegaly, which I've only seen on Spanish websites. So really? it's really weird that they kept writing that in instead of acromegaly, which is the common, you know, when you when you pronounce the, the uh, disorder disease in in a english it's always acromegaly i just i just kept having it just stuck with me (laughs) and i I think it was probably pretty novel to people i don't think people would necessarily be aware of it unless they were just aware of it what's what's crazy here is that you know that's the pronounced growth of bones right and Uh, yeah there's a lot i mean you yeah there's all kinds of stuff if you look up and and so you're both you're growing disproportionately so the 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 interesting thing here is that this growth hormone effect of this radio radioactive food stuff that they're trying when it hits humans it hits them unevenly and it deforms them and ultimately kills them which is completely different from what happens with in a giant monster movie where giant monsters tend to grow more or less in proportion so that you wind up with you know so it's that so in a way you've got two horrors going on in this movie the one which is fairly uh, fairly usual which is uh we've we've injected a guinea pig and so now we got a giant guinea pig and we've injected some humans and we've got humans with a horrible radiation sickness that's going to kill them i just find that i find that fascinating that that uh you know they've that they bother to put it in you almost don't need the the, yeah please the well the thing is with it they're creating a growth serum. Yeah. Acromegaly is a result of excess of growth hormone. Yeah. So when it hits humans, it you know it, it makes sense. It's it's really interesting. I thought it was kind of fascinating that they chose that. It wasn't just like it. Of they didn't make they something up. They, they, yeah, they they it's really an unusual they, choice. They, it's a really wild choice. I'm not against it at all. I think it's brilliant. It. You know, um, yeah. but yeah, uh, they, they stuck with I mean, it, to me, it added a layer, uh, a very, very interesting layer of of verisimilitude of of like pathos, so that yeah, you're yeah. you're watching it and you're and you're like well, this guy who is you know not only have these scientists unleashed like giant tarantula, they yeah. are they're they've they've sacrificed themselves to try to to, to see its effect on on humans and you know and they they've just gone so so wrong um that they pay the price first although you know many other people pay the price as well but um it, it uh, to me it, it made it even more poignant and um 
you know, in even more of a, like a warning against the, yeah. you know, the well, dangers of, of going and hiding yourself off in the desert and, ex- and experimenting without but, the oversight of yeah. an institution. The interesting or whatever. thing about these scientists is, is they are not, quote unquote, mad yeah. scientists. No, no, you're you right. Know, like like Lee, Leo G. Carroll does not play this like Colin Clive in the Frankenstein films mm-hmm. from decades past. You know, he plays it very straight with a lot of dignity. You know, he's never goes very over the top. And I think that that's another thing that makes this movie stand out is the fact that these guys are well-intended. You know, they're not trying to create it a race of atomic super monsters to take over <laughs> the world with. They 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 want to make giant cows so they can make more beef you know it's it's quite interesting that they they and you know for all this talk of atomic paranoia comparatively this movie doesn't really deal with you know there's not a lot of talk of the bomb you know there's not you know the, the you know the mm-hmm. atomic energy is given a little bit of lip service so it's in yeah, there using an isotope to bind the, the yeah the synthesis together or whatever yeah yeah but it, it it isn't you know by comparatively you know you would we did them you know there's yeah. tons of stuff tying that to the bomb tests and everything Absolutely. this is i think i think the things that i enjoy about this movie is this a lot about the stuff that it decides not to do the sort of yes, choices yeah. it makes to differentiate it from <clears throat> other other movies of this genre um that's which again it sort of elevates it from from being some of the, like you know the some of the other movies that came out in in the you know in this the same uh field like like the deadly mantis or, or yes. something like that I, I wanted to mention one other one other thing that popped into my head though and I, i'm not clear in the same way that Tony would like to see more research on where do we get the idea of big bugs per se, like what were the first conference calls about that like? I'm not clear also on how pe- how familiar people were with the experiments that happened at Los Alamos, but if you watch the movie Fat Man and Little Boy, which is about the making of the atomic bomb, right, and it had Paul Newman, um, John Cusack plays a, a physicist who is doing experiments behind a behind the lead walls, just like they've got here going on. You know, he's got the mechanical gloves and and he's using tongs and stuff to move pieces onto one another and this actually happened this this totally actually happened in reality so the guy accidentally drops two of the pieces together they begin to go through a critical chain reaction he knows that because he's a physicist and so he reached in with his hand to move a brick off of this um this piece of plutonium and uh, it was just an instant thing that he received this this horrible lethal dose of radiation. And the results were massive swelling, you know, horrible out of proportion swelling of his arm. You know, he he was just and it, basically it just wreaked havoc on his body. And, and and I have no idea if that would be familiar to people watching this, but it sure popped into my head because I've seen Fat Man and Little Boy. Uh, I, I have no idea. I mean, I know yeah. the Japanese were deeply familiar with radiation sickness, but I don't know yeah. how familiar Americans were. You know, I mean, I, I, if to, if we're going to you know, talk a little bit more about this, like the, what are the origins of this link between radiation and um, and, and, and giant creatures? Um, well, you guys did um, the beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Remember when you did that? Oh my God! Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did that a long well, you remember, time ago. So that's, ni- that's 1953, and mm-hmm. they they're they're you know, exploding like atomic bombs um, in the, what was it like the Arctic, right? And they, and they set, they let loose this gigantic creature. And there's, isn't there like a, um, like a a line sometime, like, you know, something about, you know, what's going to be the effects of like all these atomic explosions down the years or whatever. Um, And, and so, you know, a couple of sites that I've looked at have suggested that, that that's where, you know, the, in the public's mind, the connection between gigantic creatures and atomic bombs um, may have emerged from that, or also in like um, in like in studios' minds, because then you start getting you know like right on the heels of that them and Godzilla and stuff. So, you know, I, I don't know. It could be a link there that it's you know it's a really tenuous link because in uh, the Beast you're you're just awakening a creature from the ice. But you know, I mean, it, there, there could be. I mean, you could see that happening. You could see that link mm-hmm. occurring. No, abs- absolutely. I, I, 
I or guess, at least being a piece of the of the puzzle, you know. Yeah, no, it, absolutely, and and it's it's sort of it's sort of everything in expressing just how big this, you know, it's it in that sense, it's kind of an obvious metaphor, right? It's just this we've created something very very big. What what's surprising to me, exactly like Drew was saying about the surprisingness of this film, is they're doing two things here. They're giving us the giant bug fantasy, but they're also giving us a very frightening reality. You know, when John Agar comes out and I, and I want to talk, uh, uh, I want to turn to, to John Agar, but when, when John Agar comes out and says, uh, here, uh, here are some painkillers to give Leo G. Carroll, Carroll. And she goes, is there any hope? And he just shakes his head. No, because of course there's not. And, you yeah. know, and, Which was, and, I thought it was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that was amazing. You know, yeah. in Mission Impossible 2, she has like 12 hours to live because she's been injected by this thing that will liquefy her, her cells. And, yeah, yeah. you know, he's able to give her a magic serum that makes her uh, a healthy uh, girl again. That This movie doesn't exist in, the, in that kind of absurd world. In that you know? kind of reality, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, and... <laughs> Another thing I want to point out is um, I think it's important to understand like what they were exactly trying to do. So I, the, the gigantism is an unexpected side effect because remember what they're trying to do is to feed these animals without feeding them by the, injecting them with this thing. Have it's it like yeah. it should keep them from having to eat. Like there's even one point where he's like such as such a creature has has only big been living on injections for i don't know how many weeks or whatever and so yeah it the they they weren't expecting this to be a side effect for for things to like grow larger but once they do then they're like oh shit these things are going let's inject some more shit what let's inject the baby rat you know yeah. um which is not necessarily a mad scientist thing but it is kind of like a lot of our medicine are are like accidental a lot of things that they treat like they they try they were trying to, to treat x thing and then they accidentally found out that it didn't help X thing, but it helped this other thing that they had no yeah. idea was going to help. And so, you know, and then they just refine it from there. And I think that's well, the, 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 typical. The, the, the only question I have about this whole experiment is like, okay, you have a guinea pig. All right. You have a rat. All right. <laughs> See, this thing is possibly you know might go off the rails and it makes things very very large <laughs> why give it to a tarantula that is the only problem like as as a, you know i can suspend my disbelief for everything but i'm like that is that i'm kind of like yeah why well, but that's the kind that? of hilarious thing that creates the genre because i mean you know that with if if scientists thought that well enough then then these movies would never happen you know um deep blue sea happens because they want to do experiments on helping people with brain injuries but because sharks uh brains grow fast they give extra growth hormone to sharks for their brains so they wind up with super smart sharks if the brain <laughs> if the if the scientists had been thinking <laughs> <laughs> like if they had had the wisdom of the genre itself, they would have gone. Well, this is a terrible idea. <laughs> Let's make something that's not a predator smart. Why do we want to make predator smart? What is fucking wrong with us? <laughs> well, that's that's the thing. That's the thing about like this has a smart. It has a smart script that hinges uh -huh. on one really dumb thing. Yes, and. I mean that with no ill. I've already said I love this movie. I'm yeah. not saying that from a standpoint of being mean spirited in the slightest. It's like yeah. you have to give over that hump. And and okay. once you do, we yeah. we can get over it though, Drew. I'm gonna I'm I, I I think I have the answer. So if you remember, there's a part um, during which um, uh, Professor Deemer is like explaining what really happened, and he's and he's talking about the the other uh, scientist. Uh, I can't think of his name right now who died, um, you know, four days after like injecting himself or whatever. Right. And he said he was obviously, he was like an older, even older perhaps than Deemer. And he was just, and he was, uh, he said something, he kept pushing and he was desperate, whatever. And so maybe that's the dumbass who injected yes. the tarantula. Maybe he was yeah, like, just so he, desperate. He said, it just seemed like a good idea. Yeah, fuck, let's I'm just inject the tarantula. It. You know. Well, and you have tarantulas out in the desert. So he was probably yeah, like, yeah. oh, I've got one of those. Let's see what happens. We yeah. don't, don't, don't do, please scientists don't do that. But. You know, I this, love 
the gimmick of of the tarantula. Oh, but let's save it. Let's save it. I want to talk about John Agar and 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 then uh, uh, Arnold, and then I want to talk about the nature of how, how this tarantula kills people. John Agar is like the least respected actor in Hollywood. He's like his generation's Ted McGinley. He is he is this guy who would show up in if you had a movie that involved any sort of on the loose monster or any sort of wacky kind of concept, John Agar would be there and he would bring a sort of, he, he doesn't have anything that I would call gravitas. What he has is a kind of smirking, handsome actor, kind of joie de vivre. You get the, you get the impression that he's sort of happy just to be operating, you know, with, no matter what's going on in the world around him. I like John Agar. I, I, I find him to be fascinating. And, and, but I know that, that he, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't get a very, a very good rap. Do you guys have any yeah. impression of this guy? I don't actually think he's as bad as mystery science theater 3000 <laughs> has led people to believe he's served. And honestly, okay. So it, this is, this is my defense of him, him and, and, and Mara Corday, yeah. their romance to me, is a thousand times more believable than a lot of other movie romances because yeah, absolutely they, they actually have good yeah, chemistry. chemistry. Yeah, they yeah. actually have good chemistry. So I think he's he's serviceable. You know, yeah. like I don't I don't think he's a great actor. Like like he's certainly not giving the same performance that Leo G. Carroll is giving in this. But no. you know, he he does stuff. You know, like like you you mentioned already mentioned the really the 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 head nod thing that he gives. You know, he yeah. he 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 sells that stuff. And I think um you know look as far as fifties science fiction actors go, I'm more of a Richard Carlson kind of guy. But um you know I think Richard I think Carlson. He, I, I'm I'm trying to remember who that is. Um he is I'm the sorry. Uh, he is the lead in Creature from the Black Lagoon. Oh of course. And, yeah. uh, you know, I sure. think, uh, I think the best, the best screen on screen Reed Richards we never got. And, um, <laughs> I, I think he's a much, he played a lot of, uh, he, he also played a lot of these scientist heroes and these kind of movies. And I think he's more believable than John Agar and a better actor, but I don't think John Agar, like, I think Mr. I hate that I'm not trying to rag on Mystery Science Theater or like what you like. I think that they made it kind of hip to to bag on John Agar when I you wouldn't know, even lay it at what... the feet of MST3K. Uh, I was just I was going all the way back, you know, run your mind back to 1980, and here is where I would pin the 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 hatred of John Agar, um, and it was Harry and Michael Medved's Golden Turkey Awards where they set aside a big hunk of space to talk about how awful John Agar is. By the way, I really like this book. It's become fashionable to hate the Medveds, but I still think Golden Turkey Words is a funny book, you know, even if you even if you like most of the movies in it. But they they single him out. I have a feeling that people would have kind of forgotten all about him if not for the the Medveds. I don't think that they would have been forgotten because he's in a lot of memorable movies. Oh, like people point. remember tarantula people remember the creature walks among us people remember the mole people which is hokey, revenge of the revenge of the creature well and what's cool about revenge of the creature remember or, or to to me anyway was how it was populated with like hard-working scientists who all knew their business which is exactly what's going on here john agar again is a hard-working you know local doctor i mean he's kind of to to me I'm not trying to go too far with this, but John Agar seems to play these roles that are like exactly what America thought of itself as in the 50s, as supremely capable beyond our own imagining, but also humble enough not to imagine that we would do those things. You know, he's not Leo G. Carroll trying to change the world. He's just a hardworking family doctor who's going to fly all around and wind up solving everybody's problems. I mean, that's yeah. that's like... He, he's and he's handsome, but he's going to smile. Yeah, you know, I think I think there's something to be said for that. That, that he's a stand-in for America, and I mean, one of the things I really liked is his line de- delivery uh, when um, he and um, and Steve uh, are <laughs> sitting, you know, before the the rocks start falling, um, and they're and he's talking about the aerial view of the desert, and and he says that that it looks like something from another life, serene, yeah. quiet, yet, yet strangely evil, as if it were hiding its secret from man. And then she says, well, you make it sound so evil. creepy. And he <laughs> says, the unknown always is. And so 
for America in the 50s, the idea that nature is hiding a secret and that makes nature evil. And, yeah. you know, and that the thing, the, the unknown is something creepy. I mean, that is that's America in the 50s. You know, we you know, we want everything to be shiny and bright and patriotic and easy to understand and on the surface. And anything that's not like that is un-American and suspicious and so forth. And, Isn't that um, interesting? So, yeah. yeah. And, and these are these can be people that we love. And yet that distrust yeah. Of yeah. of otherness is also what can make them do profoundly terrible things, and um, all right. So John Arnold, Jack, sorry, Jack Arnold is the director. Uh, what ties all this stuff together, Drew? I mean, like you know, we talked about Revenge of the Creature, which has the same lead as this movie. You know, uh, he made the. You know, there's all these like threads, and I'm wondering if if it was is he an artiste, and this is stuff he's interested in doing. Uh, you know, the Incredible Shrinking Man. You know, is more of the of the radioactivity, or or what's going on in Jack Arnold's career? Well, Jack, Jack Arnold, um, he was a science fiction fan from you know way back when he was a kid and he was actually a very prolific director you know he had he did he did westerns he did comedies you know all kinds of films but it's the science fiction genre that he really um he really kind of excelled at and he you know universal gave him a lot of <laughs> freedom to to put these ideas into these movies and you know there's there's tons of science fiction movies being made at this time but arnold's movies are the ones that people remember usually yeah, that's true you know, it's a really he, good point yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, he, a lot of the, the producer in a lot of these films was a, a man named uh, William, William Allen. And he trusted Jack Arnold, you know, with, with these, he, he got him good scripts. And it was like I was saying earlier, Jack Arnold knew how to, to shoot a movie, you know, in, in a lot of respects, I think he gets kind of glossed over. Um, unlike a lot of, you know, the idea of like a genre art tour didn't mm. really come about until like the, the late 60s into the, like, like the first person I think of when we think of, you know, these sort of American horror and sci-fi art tours is George Romero. Um, you yeah. know, there were some guys over in Europe that, that people would, would say, predate this but in terms of american cinema i really think george romero is is the first guy we really think of that so so guys like jack arnold kind of get glossed over because he's very much a uh a product of the studio system you know he he had a very workman-like career he did a lot of tv um and you know i think you almost have to be an aficionado of this stuff to even know his name and yeah. i it is it is really a shame to me that he isn't as revered as he is he is he should be you know i i i you know creature from the black lagoon you know it came from outer space you know incredible shrinking man a lot of these movies are my favorite movies and you know i think most people would say you know the best movies of their type you know or among the best anyway and you know i think even though there, i i even run across people who watch a lot of genre stuff and they they can talk up and down about how much they like these movies but they don't even realize they were directed by yeah. the same guy even yeah. though it's funny like you see carryovers between films like you see use of the same themes you see use of the same actors yeah. You know, this movie, uh, like, it's important, you know, should be pointed out, like, this movie also has a young Clint Eastwood in it. Like, Arnold reused the same actors over and over again, which yeah. is something we would associate with an Artur. But, you know, that wasn't really part of the, the cultural lexicon yet. And I, I, I really do think it's a shame. Like, I, 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 I like it that we've actually done quite a bit of his his films now uh because of this podcast you know we did the creature films and now we're doing this and yeah. you know i i i'm glad that you know we're, our podcast is giving him some some due and i know other people have but you know I, I i i really do i hate the ramble but i really do think it's a shame that he's he's often overlooked as a, as a as an important director because i think in terms of of this sort of sci-fi horror sort of mashup i think he's he's definitely one of the linchpins of this genre 
That's thank you very much because I I'm sure that people haven't really talked about Jack Arnold much in the last couple of years for all the reasons you're talking about. You can know all the stuff and not who not know who's involved. So that's that was that was a pretty good recap of somebody's career. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, we've done this is probably I guess our third Jack Arnold movie, and you know I've I've just very much enjoyed I've enjoyed this guy's ability to craft a story with with uh you know he, he keeps a, a tight little story not so many characters he usually op- only opens it up really big at the very end from what i can see of of uh of these movies so far um so back to the tarantula itself and how it actually kills this is the most memorable thing about the tarantula that i i, I loved this I, I like by the way that john agar goes to like equip all of us with the information about how a tarantula works and and the fact that it's not particularly poisonous to a human but it's because this is a giant one then it would be super poisonous but what's interesting is that the tarantula basically melts its food and then slurps <laughs> and then slurps it up right. <laughs> so it's great. So if he's going to kill a human, he's going to melt the human first and then drink him like a smoothie. And I just think that's brilliant. It's just so gross and and weird. That's pools of venom in this case as well. That's the that's it's he does what? Yeah. Leaving behind pools of venom. Pools of it. As well. Pools of like, it. Yes. But what, what I and I often wondered this watching cop shows and watching this. At what point do you? What, what point is it safe where you you I'm put sorry, your hand in a thing <laughs> and then you put that in your mouth? Like you'll see, yeah, like that, and he's a he's a doctor. Cops, what the fuck is wrong with you him? Know, you'll see <laughs> cops insane. like. Oh yeah, that's totally cocaine. Oh, oh, PCP definitely. Like, <laughs> I don't think that's really procedure. I have to say, I've asked not somebody a, not like that. super professionals, like, or you just have like, yeah, or maybe you just have that one cop. You know, you see this multiple times where people do this, like, stick their finger in something and taste. Oh yeah, that's totally this. You got the one cop who's always like, uh, let me just make sure that's cocaine. Uh, mm, uh, mm. Like, I, mm, I don't know. Let me wait. Just. Oh yeah, yeah, totally cocaine. Um, but you know, it's, I mean, I'm just yeah. testing it. It's fine. But this guy like puts venom in his mouth. Like, yeah. Oh, that, that's weird. That's something. It, I think it's venom. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> like no, you scoop it up and you take it to the lab first. Then immediately, like a like a child, like a toddler. Yes. <laughs> but I, you see this all the time. <laughs> it's just. It's one of those things that bugs me slash I'm I'm really curious if there's any scientists or, you know, regular in the police department. You, they, that's the way you sample things, of course. Don't take it back to the lab. Stick it in your mouth first. I asked somebody about this in the past week, oddly oh, enough, yeah. before watching Tarantula. <laughs> and apparently, no, this is not procedure. You don't. Yes, that's what I figured. <laughs> <laughs> or otherwise, like, especially with drugs. <laughs> I've always got this person like... I mean, like, if something's blood, here's the thing. You have tests that you can, just like at the airport when they test your saline solution for your contact lenses, they have things they can hold over it. They have little drops they can put on it. And if it changes color, it's whatever. That's how you tell if something is is cocaine or blood. (laughs) (laughs) But, yeah, this is something that was all, all the radiation here, all the bad radiation was caused by this one isotope. So... No, it's, this is patently absurd. That that is hilarious, though. I love that because <laughs> the, the venom is turning to dust, so it looks like like basically like bug, like something you might scatter on your lawn to kill bugs, right? And it's being left in these giant troughs. So after, in other words, just to think through this, after the giant spider creeps up on you and stabs you and paralyzes you, it then melts you. And then drinks you. Sucks up your protein. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then <laughs> the venom that it used to paralyze you and melt you remains behind, where it loses all of its liquidity and turns into uh, a, a bitter dust. Basically, it's still liquid in the like they show part of its powder, part of its liquid. Oh, okay. It scoops yeah. it up I... in the in the in the thermos. Okay, I missed it. Some and brings stuff. it. You know, he brings it to the scientist and is like. So I was just like, that's a, that is a lot of venom. Where'd you get all this? 
<laughs> that's kind of the catalyst. Like, you need like a hundred tarantulas yeah, or a tarantula a right. hundred <laughs> times the size of a normal one. Ha ha, you're so funny. You're yeah, right. that was a good yeah scene. exactly. That was a great scene. Oh my god. Um, and you know they have it. Speaking of cool scenes, guys. Yes. The 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 uh, accident on the road that was oh, incredible. Man, yeah. That thing, I was like, holy shit! How did they do that? Did they like catapult that fucking? truck off of the road that was amazing yeah. no it's, it's yeah, true they, that's that was really good yes i have yeah. no idea how they did that but those two poor mexican dudes that were driving that truck oh, I, you that's know, really bad, yeah. madre, as we say they were they were <laughs> smashed as shit <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's... Like, did they survive um they're their bones no. over there so oh no. <laughs> so, no i like the two guys also who were out in the desert oh that you was know, talking crazy. about city folk and you know laughing it up and then all of a sudden <laughs> Oh, up about scientists. I wonder, maybe they're just having a problem with their Geiger counter. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, green horns. And this is, a, this is a common... <laughs> It's a common motif. Like, remember, in 1953, George Powell's War of the Worlds, you had those, those dumbasses who go out there with their flags to talk to the... Boy, what a what a dark and reactionary uh, moral this is. They go out there with their flags to to try to make peace with the Martians, and they're like we're friends, hey, we're friends, and then you know it it just it basically turns them all to skeleton. Well, I mean, I get these two guys are out. They've seen a lot of stuff, and they've seen a lot of <laughs> they've seen a lot of greenhorns come out and try to give them advice. This is at that point where yeah, it's true. Science and mistrust of science, like oh, you can do your. You know, you, I bet you could be more efficient herding your cattle or growing your crops this way. Ah, and they're laughing at that. But yeah. in reality, a tarantula lies in wait. I will say one thing that I wouldn't say bugs me, but it, so tarantula, uh, I guess, decides to get revenge because it comes back to the doctor's house. Yeah, it does. Yeah. On its on its way, it gets shocked, and the power <laughs> kind of goes down. And it doesn't really take out the power, but it and then eventually they use dynamite on it. Yeah, you know, it takes it takes you know not to jump. The dynamite it. doesn't work either, Tony. Yeah, I but mean, it, the, it seems like dynamite would hurt a tarantula. Sure, seems like, the like dynamite is on the road, and it just like blows up. Like, like for dynamite to hurt something, it has to, it needs to be on it. I mean, it blew up towards it, but, but that yeah, thing but is I freaking mean, huge. By the time that by it's time like the, the shockwave reached it, I mean, it was like weak. That's what. Yeah, that's yeah but a, a grenade doesn't do much shrapnel damage. It does compression damage. Right. Well, well I mean, I'm just I thinking that if you explode, if from you explode the, that much dynamite next to something, I mean, it's it's in service of the of the plot. The plot. It, yeah. That's fine. You know, we we need America's Air Force to save us yeah. in the small town. Also, and that's it probably would have been to... hard to like show the, the the spider being wounded since they were like filming an actual tarantula climbing all over. Yeah, that was really cool. I mean, I I spotted a few places where they didn't kind of cut the mat as yeah, nicely, man. but it does look really good for there. There's a lot of other monster movies where they film a real thing and it just kind of doesn't really work, but. This overall works pretty well. I was, you know, you know the, oh, the, the, impressed. the interesting thing about this and this, I think for, you're absolutely right, Tony. Like, I think for this kind of thing, this <laughs> looks really good. Mm-hmm. But Universal chose to do this because they felt like this is more convincing than the ants and them. Mm-hmm. And I like this movie a lot. I've I've sung a lot of its praises. I in no way think this looks more convincing than the puppets and them. I I am I am dumbfounded by that. I I I I I can understand maybe it was probably less expensive than making, mm-hmm. you know, full size, you know, full size spider puppets. But, you know, I, I, I don't know. Does anybody feel like this is more convincing than them? I, I, I did honest. like it. I, I, I actually liked the, this looked to me more real than the puppets in them, but it's six, one half dozen, the other I'm fine either way. You know, the problem I was really is, impressed. Yeah. Yeah, no, the problem with this is there there are scenes when the thing is in the distance where it looks pretty cool, but especially to like a modern brain, like we understand, especially like there have been like really great versions of large CGI um, oh, sure. spiders. There's no weight to this thing. It's something that size. That's a good would, point. You know, it would be leaving like little craters as it walked. It would be shaking the earth. It's like too, it's too big to just be softly walking over things. That's um, a really good point. Know, yeah, yeah, that's so, that's totally so, like true. my brain. My brain rebelled against that sort of thing. There's no, you know, it's 
it's just a What's... blown up. It's like like when you see like um, model ships um, on like bathtubs or whatever. Water right. behaves differently. In or think sizes. of think of the adults in Empire Strikes Back. How the how the the camera, the sound effects, the camera work, everything everything rumbles when the adults walk. And yeah. you're right. That's a, that's that's an extremely good point. But What's... my point is, I didn't really think about it. Go ahead, Tony. I'm sorry. What's funny is, you, you know, you cite CG, but you said this doesn't have weight, but it's usually, that's the problem of CG, is yeah. it often, if less you get the right people, uh, you know, animating it, the weight distribution, how things move, is usually a huge problem. Um, it's kind of funny that you pointed out, because I've seen so much CG where you're just like, that's not how a thing... Oh, yeah, no, that, that's... You know, like, that's how that would move. Mm. Um, but I mean, there's also been some really good stuff, like Shelob and and um in the last yeah, Lord yeah. of the Rings. That was real. I mean, that was really really well done. And you could, you know, and a lot of it has to do also with what Jason is suggesting. It's about um the the sound effects and the camera moves, and you can, you know, you create the illusion of weight by dust coming up off the ground, and just things like that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I still go to it. It's a horrible movie, um, but. Uh, Wild Wild West, the best oh, yeah. part of the movie is the giant spider. And not only that, but the sound design of mm -hmm. the spider is has no right. Like the sound designers, that's a case of somebody who's amazing at their craft and has done this thing regardless of if they knew the movie was going to be crap or not. Yeah. They, went, they were going to do their we job. We were going to make this giant mechanical spider sound the best it possibly can and it is amazing there there's like yeah. all these creaking and there's wires being pulled and that sound of wires being pulled and hit on and all that stuff and you watch i yeah, i was watching it going wow i just i wonder what else is this foley artist and these sound designers have done because this is amazing it has no right to be in this it's so have, have sad you ever thought about that? The film, man. There. Yeah. i mean th think about that where where you know you have a whole team sometimes many 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 teams working on the special effects for something but unless that movie is lucky enough also to be a big hit it's almost as though the work didn't exist you know yeah you, oh you, man i've worked on tons of games that way like you yeah. can do the best animation you can do or the best models that are possible at the time your textures can be impeccable if the game plays like crap yeah. no one cares it's you know it might even play well i mean you can do everything right and still have a failed product launch you know sure. you can have a perfectly good movie and then because another movie is coming out that has a similar idea your movie goes straight to dvd and nobody watches it or your star can get arrested for something and so the movie gets set on the shelf for six months a million th things can go wrong and and everybody who worked on that all that's it it's just so strange that we only bring attention to the hard work of people whose overall project is already celebrated um i mean maybe that's not completely true there are such things as the there are the oscars and they don't necessarily care if something was a hit but they kind of do i mean it kind of helps yeah. If 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 the movie I don't know they gave it. they gave Suicide Squad uh, an Oscar. Well, there you go. Yeah, but for special effects. So. Yeah, but yeah. that's what I'm talking Which about. Is, like like fair. so that's a fair. that's a good example in the opposite direction. That's a very good example. But yeah. As far as this thing goes, the spider steering yeah. us back to the movie that we're talking about gets um, attacked by the Air Force. Well, and I, just wanna, I just want to. I just want to say. I just want to say this. To yeah. me, the best that this spider looks is that point right before the very end of the movie, where it's walking towards them and they're throwing dynamite at it. Yeah, and that. Yeah. One, I think yeah. it looks really cool. Yeah, yeah. I think it. It actually. I thought the parts where it was crawling over, even though, like I said, some of the mats weren't cut uh, towards quite the end, right. Yeah. Um. The Parts where it's crawling over mountains and rocks, and also the part anytime where it's dark, where it kind of blends in. So like the scenes where it's uh, oh, yeah. interacting with the power lines, or you know, they <laughs> yeah. even tipped over one of the phone lines when it knocks it down. That kind of yeah. stuff looks pretty darn cool. That was really but neat when it knocks over the phone line. I, I totally believed that moment. That was great. That, that was. But it that does was... have an air of a. You know, I understand where David's coming from, where there's parts of it that just don't feel like it has the weight that it needs to 
to fit in with how large it is. Um, and that's where, you know, that mix of practical and film kind of needs to happen. Like the close up, I mean, obviously it didn't work for like King Kong where they had a giant hand that just didn't kind of work. Yeah. But, um, you know, this, if, if they'd somehow mixed what was in them along with that, those shots were it's far away. I mean, making a spider move correctly, dynamically, especially the way a tarantula moves, is not easy. I mean, yeah. I was animate I, spiders, and it's not it's not an easy thing to, to make look convincing. So, yeah, I was kind of ragging on it earlier, which was a little unfair because I do actually enjoy it. But I think the deadly mantis. It, it combines they have a large puppet that they use for certain scenes and then for some scenes they do actually you know have a a real mantis matted in like they do in this and i think that the effects and the deadly mantis are actually kind of underrated because mm. i think you know i think that that one looks pretty darn cool you know i, 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 I haven't it. seen the deadly mantis so i'll have to i'll have to check that out i uh, don't think it's as good of a movie <clears throat> as this and i think it's a far cry from being as good as them but it's a fun movie and um you know i i i if i were to have to choose between a big bug movie uh between this and that one i would still choose this one all day every day but it is a fun movie i should i shouldn't have ragged on it earlier no no it, it's well i'm sure it's all for good and we do tend to cut we tend to tease the movies that we that we really like uh um all right we show so yeah i got one last question the napalm happens and we'll wrap up and then i want to go to the bonus segment the so they napalm this thing uh napalm being a a sort of dangerous you know constantly burning liquid fuel that would become so incredibly popular during the vietnam war uh to our great shame but ha this is a neat effect the, uh, the the spider burning up you know, the, the fact that they've created a problem so big that the only way to solve it is to drop fire on it. And everybody looks basically just tremendously relieved and horrified that this was the only way out of this was to cook this spider. Um, yeah. What, uh, first of all, how, what are we looking at? Is this a model that we've set on fire or what's going on? That yeah. is, hello? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I'm, here. I, I'm pretty sure it's, it, Looks like that, um, you know. Unless they, I, I know it. they didn't set the actual tarantula on fire because they reused it in other films. So that's not it. <laughs> there you go. Well, I think you can get a lot of tarantulas. <laughs> yeah. No, no. <laughs> I mean, they, no, in, I... In, in in trivia, it says that they actually they use that same um, uh, spider in. Um, oh God, I'll, I'll look it up right now. In, in another film, that exactly set that same tarantula. Weirdly hmm. enough. Well, yeah. tarantulas are oddly long, are are relatively long lived, like twenty two years. Or something. Well, yeah, first, th there was a tarantula in Goldfinger. Yeah, here it is. The spider worth. that portrayed the giant tarantula later appeared in The Incredible Shrinking Man as a spider mm -hmm. that threatened the Shrinking Man. Okay. Oh. Wow. So Jack uh, Jack uh, Arnold really reuses. He, that. he really uses the same yes. actors. <laughs> um, That's amazing. So, well, okay. Speaking of him reusing the same actor, the fighter pilot that kills the tarantula is actually Clint Eastwood. You said that's Clint Eastwood. I that I is, did not notice that. That I is that I, is Clint Eastwood. Well, you don't really see his face; you see his eyes. Yeah. But this is the first recorded, I believe, first recorded on screen death by Eastwood. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yes. As oh. a man with no name, also, right? Yeah. There you go. Yeah, it's Indeed. an uncredited part. So he is a <laughs> so man he's, with no name. He's a man with no name killing something. That's awesome. And I was reading, actually, he gave uh, Mara Corday uh, parts Eastwood and, and her hit it off. Oh, good. And so they were friends throughout. Um, she was in several, you know, she's in the gauntlet. And a few others. No kidding. Um, she was like a penthouse model. I, I mean, a Playboy yeah. model and a showgirl. I didn't Playboy know that. model, showgirl, lots of stuff. You know, she's she's an interesting had an interesting. Li I actually I I didn't talk about it very much throughout this. Uh, one of the reasons why I rewatched this movie so much as a kid is I had a I had a crush on her. Um, like Mara I, Corday? I, I thought huh. she. I just think she is so beautiful. Like, like I. She is I, quite beautiful. She is sure. Yeah. Like, like, like I. You know, there's, there's more famous actresses to be sure, and you know, she doesn't. This isn't the greatest, you know, written part and everything. But I just, I, I, I have a certain amount of affection for Steve. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I like her, and I, I like that. I like her like a plum in the face of all the the. <laughs> The kind of like anti-woman sentiment, this a winking kind of you know 
give women the right to vote and they start turning out women scientists, you know, this kind of, yeah. Yeah, not just, yeah. she just kind of like smiles and laughs and is like more competent than like most of them. Uh, although yeah. she does turn into a damsel in distress at the end, but, but for like a good chunk of the movie, she's, she holds her own. I love Absolutely. the exchange between her and Josh. And when she's like waiting, um, like just like, he, she doesn't even let him finish his sentences and just cuts him off. Like, <laughs> she's a great, great actor. Oh, she's yeah. lovely. Yeah, what do you think? She's she's really she's sexy. She's a, she is a good actress, and you know she's very believable. It, it's fun seeing her. You're right. I, I hadn't actually, um, I hadn't looked her up at all. But uh, yes, she is a, a an interesting actress, and she plays this this well, part pretty well. I'm glad Tony brought that stuff up, up because I mean I I I uh, she again she's an inter- you know people should take a you know if they're taking a more a deeper interest in the movies that we talk about on the show. Like she's, she's worth looking into because she had a outside of being a beautiful actress. She had a very interesting life. So huh. I, or is, is has, she's still alive. She's 88 years old, but um, I, I didn't mean to kill you. Uh, Maricorde. I, I, uh, I apologize. <laughs> um she's still kicking it uh. yeah no apparently she was in sudden impact that's really wonderful yeah uh, that's that's pretty cool um i mean so, i guess they would have met on this podcast. yeah I, i'm guessing that this is where they met and you know still had her in movies you know all throughout the yeah. all throughout that series of, of films so that's pretty cool yeah sudden impact is that the one yeah that's the one where he goes like up the coast to go after a bunch of he's going after a vigilante who is killing rapists and it's uh that that's that's one of the best sort of and and culty uh dirty hairy movies that there was and she played a sassy uh waitress okay so let's get our final thoughts on uh on tarantula and so we went uh drew it was Drew, David, Tony, and then I'll go. So, Drew, uh, final thoughts on Tarantula. Well, what a what a fun discussion this was. I am I am glad that we we got around to doing this one. Um, again, it's it's to me the second best of the 1950s giant bug movies, but that that uh, that is by no means a uh, an insult. You know, them to me is a great great film. This is a very good film, and I think it's. Uh, a good Jack Arnold movie. I don't think it's his best. My personal favorite remains Creature for the Black Lagoon, but I know a lot of people also love uh, The Incredible Shrinking Man, and it, yeah. it came from outer space. So I like I like the fact that we were able to talk about Jack Arnold. I was, you know, I love anytime we can do uh, a fifties movie, and anytime we could do a Universal Studios movie. Of course, I I I feel like I I kick up my my <laughs> my feet in glee. So, uh, you know, I, I was, I was glad that we were able to talk about this one and I, I'm looking forward to continuing on with this retrospective. This has been such a fun series of discussions. I'm telling you, I'm enjoying this one so much. Uh, I, you know, uh, we've made it an extra big retrospective because we just keep thinking of other movies that we want to do. <laughs> so, um, gosh, uh, was it Tony next? I think no, it was David. David. Oh, David. All right, David. Um, your uh, final thoughts, Tarantula. So yeah, no. Uh, as I said, I, I liked it a lot. There was it's got a smart script and great performances. Um, I I like the the optimism about uh, humanity and what we do for humanity that that Professor Deemer um, puts across as a really great scene uh, between um, the 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 Doctor uh, Hastings and Deemer, where there he's the professor's explaining why he's doing what he's doing and. He, talking about the future and the population growth. And, and Hastings says, well, not many of us look that far in the future, sir. Mm. And the professor replies, our business is the future. No man can do it on his own, of course. You don't pull it out of your hat like a magician's rabbit. You, well, you build on what hundreds of others have learned before you. And I just thought that was a really cool message that it's not, yeah. he doesn't see himself as being some like brilliant genius. He is standing on the shoulders of the giants who've come before him no pun intended, and um, is trying to, to do something special. It goes awry, and, you know, and, and, and lots of people die. Uh, but that sense I thought was really, really cool. And it's and it's presented in this, like, really, it's not a winking way. There's no cynicism about it. This guy is, he, he, she was truly trying to do something good. And, and that makes, her, you know, his demise um, Absolutely. in the end, you know, even more poignant. So 
I, I thought it was great. You care about the characters. You don't want to see them die. It's a good film. Mm, thank you. Uh, Tony, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I really like the movie. It Again, it doesn't hold up as well to them um in in many ways but it's still a really cool uh giant insect movie it does a lot with the small town setting which i think is is really interesting um you know over the years we tend to because it's so much quote-unquote cooler to destroy a city or attack you know something with lots of collateral damage it's kind of cool that the detective work part of this takes place out in you know, kind of the middle of nowhere and how the people interact. And I, I think that part's fascinating as well. Um, it's it's fun. It's got a lot going for it. Some great character actor performances. Um, I definitely you know, would watch it again. Everything that you guys have said, I would just follow up on. I very much enjoyed this. And, and this whole retrospective is just making me extraordinarily happy because it's fun to, to deal with the things in the film that are goofy, but also the things underneath it that uh, that can be profound and that people aren't thinking of. And that kind of brings me over to this bonus uh, segment that I wanted to mention, um, which is, uh, so I should say to those who don't want to listen to the bonus segment, Come to the Facebook page. We will totally talk to you about Tarantula. We want to hear from you. But I want to talk about this bonus segment because, um, Drew, you posted a video uh, yes. at the Castle of Horror page. And it was uh, from, I'm, gonna, I'm looking for George, the artist. George Rockwell Schmidt. Yes. And his, uh, and his uh, essay, it was a video essay, and it was about the idea of whether movies can be so bad it's good. And just to, to really quickly sum up what his thesis was, his thesis was, no, bad movies are impossible to watch. However, bad movies that are made by uh, very peculiar people become very watchable. And that's and so basically the question is some movies are watchable and some are, are not. I mean, uh, it, I but you... You put it up because you wanted. You said, "Hey, there's an endless debate about the question of whether something can be, quote unquote, so bad it's good." I'm curious what you think about that, and and I wanted to hear what everybody else thought because it is a phrase that we hear uh, all the time uh, well, in this kind of stuff. Go ahead. We, we certainly give it a lot of lip service on this show. We talk about this sort of thing a lot, and you know, I I was actually engaging with one of our our fans on on facebook uh hello by the way and yeah. uh we were talking about um night of the lepus and there's a a, a i guess a, a a you know it was discussion about whether or not it was okay to make fun of night of the lepus and i i will never tell anybody how to engage with a movie i think that that's an incredibly personal thing mm. um but the thing is is like when i watch a movie like Night of the Lepus, which is a very silly movie, it has to be said, yeah. uh, and not a particularly well-made one. But I, I don't really engage with it on that ironic level that I think a lot of people do. Like I, I engage it more in it that I enjoy watching something that's weird mm. for the sake of weirdness. And you know, it, that got me thinking about the whole question of so bad it's good. There are movies that I do think that are so bad it's good. Like I like watching a lot of, um, honestly, a lot of big budget schlocky um, stuff that Hollywood churns out. Like I love watching the, the Ghost Rider movies on the level that I think they're so bad they're good. But the, the position, I, I love I love an over-the-top Nicolas Cage. I make no apologies. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the, the argument that is made in the video, and I can kind of see even though i don't fully agree with it um i can kind of see that where he's coming from is that very few bad movies are at that exceptional level that like like an ed wood movie or something mm -hmm. like most of them have you know the example he uses is the remake of the wicker man which has one really standout scene that everybody yeah. talks about which is the part where nicholas cage gets tortures tortured with bees yeah um, but he said the, re the rest of that movie like no one could tell you anything else about that movie because the rest of that mm. movie is a chore to watch yeah and i do think there's something to that i think you know there 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 isn't a lot of plan nine from out of space running around out there however i do think there are a lot of movies that are just odd and yeah. i like watching them because they're odd and a lot of the times they are incredibly low budget so take that how you will i i would be interested to know how what, what everybody else 
feels about that though boy that's that's oh. wonderful i, I want to say a little bit but but I, I actually am also curious what everybody else thinks tony go go you were going to say something i think i have over the years come around to i no longer really enjoy the so bad it's good uh term yeah it's either bad and it's a chore and you don't want to watch it or else there's some form of enjoyment you're getting out of it um i don't tend to like and i've said this multiple times on the podcast films made to ironically the, where irony is the crutch of the movie yeah. um a lot of movies that get the so bad it's good moniker were never created for that they were made by people either just trying to make a film for because the studio told them to make a film or they're genuinely was something they were trying to get out maybe they just weren't as good at it even I think I, I kind of tur- took this turn around the time I saw American Movie, mm-hmm. where this guy's trying to make this movie, Coven. He's never going to make a great movie. But who am I to, to laugh at yeah. his struggle to make this? And, you know, you start kind of doing that. And then I, I really started thinking about it. And uh, I don't, I don't yeah. feel like that's the appropriate response anymore. Um, you know, there's, I, I, and I, Tony, I don't want to interrupt you, but, but to an an extent, what you're talking about is, I don't know if it's a function of age or what, but there comes a point when you begin having so much compassion that it becomes difficult to laugh at people's frailty. Uh, Like, I, I was part of watching a movie called Fateful Findings. And let me tell you, this is a movie I liken it when people ask, I liken it to somebody who's read about movies you, you check out every book on movies in the library yes go to make one having never seen a movie and i <laughs> know that the guy who made it has seen movies but just things like how computers like type none of the scenes where he's typing on computers are convincing he's got a guy in a in a um, hospital who has bandages around his face and the oxygen mask is on top of the bandages like uh-huh. i don't quite know how you make those kind of errors but again you know everybody's kind of poking fun and going holy crap i can't believe this is happening and then eventually you know about three quarters of the way through the movie i just felt kind of bad like i i realized this is somebody's passion project and it's it's just not for mm-hmm. whatever reason just not really good mm-hmm. you know and and i just i don't subscribe to that and i also think that going to see a movie haha let's go laugh at a movie isn't exactly it's not a a good use of my time i feel anymore and if Mm. you want to go do that you know more power to you i would rather find something good or find something that maybe is warts and all not the greatest but that's done with passion because i also think that yeah let's go laugh at a movie we can do that and that's kind of fun and i still love mystery science theater because i like a lot of the jokes but what what have you done with that passion? You know, I might ask people. Yeah. I'm no better or worse, and I'm not saying you have to make a movie to critique it or even enjoy it. It's certainly, even though I've seen that response, um, if you're making, give me a thousand movies done with passion over a soulless Hollywood blockbuster made for a demographic where you have a chart and yeah. oh, here's a checklist of things that we do. Um, you know, I feel like some of the new Transformers movies, there's there's a there's a, a new thing and it's become kind of hip to like it. And I think it's cool. There's these guys in uh, Wakali in Africa and they have this thing called Wakaliwood. Here are people, That's right. They, yes. They yes. Make, like traditionally, these movies are not good movies in, the, in comparison to like, say, a Hollywood blockbuster. But these people are making like guns out of machine parts. They only have electricity like a few days out of the week to power a computer that does these not so great effects in comparison, but they're doing everything they possibly can. And the ingenuity to make these movies is amazing. I would rather give them a hundred grand to make a thousand movies that had that amount of passion. There's no reason why they should want to make movies other than that's their passion. Give me that over the next sharknado or atlantic rim or anything that's just like cashing on a buck made to be ironic how many tweets can you get of like did you see the part with the thing ha 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 like yeah. i i don't enjoy the so bad it's good anymore it, it's good and you enjoy it warts and all or maybe you enjoy it because it's so weird i mean 
you and I have seen many, many weird Wednesdays where we look at each other like, how the hell did this get made? Like, yeah. I see the thing? Or, or in the case of Faithful Findings, like, come on, man, you've seen how hosp- like, you just go to the hospital or like watch somebody typing on a computer. What, 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 what happened? How did this come about? Yes. Um, and you know, I'm I'm I almost to the be, point where yeah. I think people. I'm ready to retire the phrase "so bad it's good" because I don't. I'd think, be fine I think with it's. That. I think it's losing. Well, I also feel like I feel like it gets misused a lot because I. That's the other thing that started to bother me about it is. Um, in relation to the movie we talked about tonight, like this would be a movie that somebody be like, "Oh, ha ha, that that old campy drive-in movie." Yes. They might and, also you know, use the well, phrase "cheesy." Yeah, um, and it's not, and it. This is not that, you know. Like this yeah. was, this was a movie that actually had a studio behind it, and it was made, you know, like like people conflate, you know, like they in their minds, this is the same thing as an Ed Wood movie, and yeah. they're not, you know, they're contemporaries of each other, and they may have some of the same themes in them, but they're not the same thing, and that is something about it that has started to really bother me. You know, and I, well, I uh, like, you know, and it's a needless thing to worry about because, yeah. So, for instance, it came from Hollywood, for instance, did skits about all of these things. And I, I forgive that because it was SCTV and it was hilarious. But I think most of that just comes from pure unfamiliarity. A kid today talking about a movie from 1955, that's pretty darn remote in time. Like David said, it's 60 years ago, you know, and it's it's just really hard for that to I'm trying to think when I was growing up to talk about a movie that came out 60 years ago, you're talking about Phantom of the Opera, the silent one, you know, the, there wasn't as much Hollywood to contend with. So it, it, you know, it doesn't surprise me that people are not. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I'm just, I'm so utterly dismissive of people who would even like open their mouths and say something that stupid <laughs> as I am, of pe- as, as, as I am of people who are like, Oh, classical music. Oh my God! And you're like, just, just look, go away. You're not yeah. even worth like addressing. You're <laughs> no, a, a fucking a, moron. Go well, away. Well, I'm the so I mean, so, so that, so that's like to me, like, like, Drew, like Drew was saying that there are people who conflate their inability to to, to process entertainment from another age with yeah. like a genuine estimation of the quality. But yeah, no, I, I'll I'll quickly chime in because I, I don't I don't I don't I don't spend a lot of time watching movies that are are ostensibly bad or whatever but i will say that what i enjoy in films is what you guys have been saying is the passion of the creators their honesty their desire to create something and that makes both good movies and it makes sometimes inept movies that can still be enjoyed at some level because um you know people were trying their best and sometimes the ineptitude itself is amusing and so forth but there's something endearing about it and that's I, so I, um, I, I'm almost kind of ashamed to admit this, but I uh, watch Red Letter Media's uh, Best of the Worst, um, and um, it just I would never probably watch any of the, the movies that they review, but I, I love seeing them talk about them and trying to decide of all these like horrible horrible movies like you know what which ones which ones can you enjoy because the the goodwill of the creators you know when it comes when it intersects with their ineptitude, um, you know, does it create this sense of endearment for you? Do you kind of laugh, not like trying to humiliate them, but because they've created something that's like, like unique and, 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 and bad, but also amusing and good because you can see how much they care about what they're doing. Um, and those kinds of films, I, you know, although I wouldn't, I don't run out to try to watch them. I can see the, the value in them. And then also, I, I I don't know. I just have like a different view of quality than, than some people. I I'll watch a film and it'll move me and I'll cry and then I'll and I'll read somewhere some critic going, oh, this is just like a, a you know just a horribly um, you know cookie cutter kind of film with maudlin um, you know obvious acting and really bad screenwriting. And I'm like, but I cried. So you know, yeah. there are things about films that that matter beyond just whether they're like gems and like perfect in every way. Um, Jason, you've said like multiple times, you know, if a film gives you something like that one scene, that one thing that you walk away from, um, the, the film, like even in the wild west, just the, yeah. the you know, the sound design, the, the Foley work, whatever it happens to be, that kind of like justifies the existence of the film to some extent, at least yeah. for you. Yeah. For, so, for me, yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, I, 
a, a good example to me, and this is going to strike people as a dumb example, but here you are. Girls Just Want to Have Fun. That's a movie from 1985 starring Sarah Jessica Parker and uh, uh, Helen Hunt. And it is about these these uh, Catholic school girls who want to be in a dance competition. Okay, it is exactly what you think it is. The way that I just said what that is, that is what that movie is. It it is by you know it's not a big budget movie. It's the kind of movie you can kind of imagine that all the stars are wearing literally their own clothes, and. And yet, I love stuff like that because it tells me so much about about 1985 when you watch it. You know, so you know, a, a movie like probably probably my favorite film that we've done a show on. I know I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got to say it again. Zombies of Moratau teach me so much about the period of when that movie is being made and the social mores and the ways the audience is expected to react. You know. The question of good or bad in the way that people say it, and, and, and I think David's got the right answer, you know, screw them. But the way people, the question of good or bad in that way, we are so far past that that it's not relevant. You know, these are works of art that we are studying for various reasons. And there's, you know, to say something is so bad, it's good. First of all, presupposes that you have to be enjoying yourself, which when you're watching something for in an academic way to study it, Enjoyment, the, the enjoyment comes from the experience of, of taking in the art itself. And, uh, you know, so I, I don't know. I'm, I, uh, I was fascinated by that. I thought his thesis was pretty good. But um, because his thesis was basically a, a movie that doesn't have quality can still be greatly watchable if the person making it is a particularly quirky person. True enough. You know, well, that's yeah, true. Even if they're not quirky, like what you have to I've seen plenty of films that, that have, you know, maybe the director was just, could have been doing it for a buck. Yeah. But what they've created is something that is, you know, if it's also, I would like to get rid of guilty pleasure. Yes. Again, I go back to if you, <laughs> if you enjoy it, yeah. the people making it aren't harming things because some people, sometimes you can support somebody who's a terrible person. And yeah, in, in theory, you people. could have such a movie, but, but um, it's but, rare. But in general, like, like I, there's a box office element to where you want more people to like a thing so that they make more of the thing that you like, yeah. right? So there is, you can't be totally, why should you care what people think? But in general, especially if you're just flipping through things that have already been made, like yeah. you have an Amazon queue, if you like something on Amazon and somebody else, a critic has critiqued it in a bad way or you're, if you love it, you don't have to get on the internet and be angry. Nope. You don't have to, like, none of that. You can just like a thing. And if somebody has a problem with you liking whatever movie that is, they that's their problem. Yeah. That's their stupidity. That's, who cares? It, I mean, even if you are in high school where you have to to fit in somewhat, you can still go home and like a thing. And well, what, what? lo and behold, you also don't, if, if you don't like a thing, you don't have to, you know, it... it, it it can be your but own people people thing. largely uh, live their lives tony to uh, and i i mean this is this is not true of the four of us but this is true of a lot of other people People live their lives to appease others and to fit in and to feel like part of a group and so if everybody in the group that you that you admire is hating on something admitting that you like it is anathema and so isn't that people, interesting like yeah. who cares yeah, just, but you're right well, you're exactly well, i mean right. i don't care but like there are tons of people who do no no care. no you're you're i i hear you in other words but it's hard for us to put our heads in like you know i see people come on come on my facebook and god love them i'm not mocking them but if, if you know they'll say listen guys I, they're afraid they go i hate to say this but i actually really liked justice league and i'm like I'm fine with you saying you liked Justice League or didn't like Justice League, but I'm gonna what's, attack with, you. <laughs> what's with the weird fear? Who cares? It's a movie. Because as an adult, because there are other settings adult, in which I say that and I'll get attacked. Yeah. yeah, as an adult, that shouldn't. There's so <laughs> many other things to worry about. Like, whether you, I, I, I did not like the Justice League, but that doesn't matter. And my yeah. not liking the Justice League has zero to do with you liking it. That yeah. is. Yeah. Completely and fine. it doesn't make you morally better than the person who does like it. Oh yeah, and, and yes. you know, there are plenty of people so, who think that they, that their that their taste in in entertainment somehow makes them ethically, morally, intellectually superior to others, and that's also bullshit. Oh hell no, I like tons themselves of about that as well. I like tons of stupid crap that only I would yeah. like, or maybe a few others would like. I mean, this goes back to what I've talked about before, where I was 
in kindergarten and I like Space Giants and none of the kids, there was one other kid who wanted to watch that show, you know, but that, that's kind of, I don't know. It's always been that thing. Um, you know, Max, who's been on the show, is a good friend, had a really good uh, thing as well, where he was talking on his Facebook, how a lot of times we, we say like, oh, it's just big, dumb fun. And fun doesn't have to be stupid. Yeah. Like you can have but fun. But it certainly can be. And who it cares if it be. is or isn't? And it, yeah. and it, yeah. But but I I do I don't as much like this idea of like oh well that's just stupid so I like stupid like yeah I know I hear it you. doesn't it when you put those together they can also be separate and I like yeah. big stupid things too sure I, you know that's well, that's fine but I hate I hate that idea that well don't worry about that because it's supposed to be stupid. Like, well, no, I you can also enjoy things that are smart and fun. Well, yeah. like, I I will say this, like, my, my um, you know, the whole question of, like, bad versus good, and, you know, again, I, 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 I do prefer, tend to prefer stuff that does have a certain quality to it but there isn't anything wrong like i I, i'm 100 percent on board with this idea that the idea of a guilty pleasure is 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 stupid you know like like if you enjoy something just enjoy it and you know there's all kinds of ways to enjoy something like i had my break you know there we we brought we we keep going back to the mystery science theater three but i i i want to bring it I kind of had a break from them when they did the Mystery Science Theater 3000 movie and they used this island Earth. And uh-huh, I remember right. at, that, at that point kind of being like, no, fuck you. I like, I like that movie. <laughs> and that's a, good, and that's a good movie. That's not what's supposed to be what you're, you're about. And sure. you know, that's kind of when I started to veer away from that whole, you know, like watching movies to make fun of them. But that's also me, you know, yeah. like I, I don't yeah. get much enjoyment out of that anymore. But, you know, there are those, you know, Jason, obviously, you know, he talks about riff tracks and whatever. He obviously still gets a lot of enjoyment still and all that kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah and does. that's fine. That's fine. The way we. I've engage, never watched any of those, by the way. Yeah, well, yeah. And the way we engage with with movies, you know, that is, again, it's a, such a personal thing. There is no real right and wrong way to do it. You know, because there's there's the intention that the the filmmaker or writer or whatever that they originally brought to it. Then there's what you bring to it while you're watching watching it and how it speaks to you. And I think that that is ultimately more important than just about anything else. Wow, that was that was really beautiful. Um, so I think we've probably killed that topic but uh yeah. i've i've very much enjoyed it and i know that we'll we'll come back to this because to be honest this is a topic that we'll never grow tired of really because we uh, it's 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 and we deal in so many films that are not what anybody would put anywhere near their top their list of even top 500 greatest films and and yet i get so much out of the things that i learn by watching them and uh, so I, I wanted to address this topic. It's a neat topic. Okay. And that brings us to the end. We should get our endorsements, though. Uh, so, Drew, what have you been watching, listening to, want us to be aware of that, uh, that we should run out and pay attention to? Well, my, my endorsement actually is the, the man that brought us to this, this capper to our episode, which is George Rockwell Smith. I, I, he's an English YouTuber and he does a lot of blog, video blogs on movies. He, he has some particularly interesting ones on the Alien series and the Predator series. And I don't know, I don't always agree with everything he says, but his, his, his outlook uh, on film is very interesting. And, you know, he, he takes a very, uh, he's funny and academic at the same time, which is something I like. Like, he's very smart while he talks, but he doesn't take himself too seriously. And, you know, his was the video that, that I posted and that started this whole conversation. And again, I think you should, if you like movies, you should check out some of his, his other video blogs on film. I, I really enjoyed them. That's a, that's a really good tip. David, do you have anything to endorse for us? I mean, I would think it would be the fact that you have a new book that came out this like this week. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that's totally my new book. But you and I will talk about that um, yeah. later. Um, the um, I've been watching a bunch of TV. My wife is in Oaxaca, in Mexico, and so there's no one to stop me from watching just all the crazy shit that I've been wanting to watch. So about you know ten years, um, 
10 years later than everybody else, I got started watching Community. And I totally, if you've not watched Community, I totally recommend watching Community. I'm yeah. now on season five, and it's really, really a fantastic show. Um, <clears throat> you know, funny, lots of great genre nods, just really, really well done, except for a bunch of episodes in season four. But um, that's the apparently the gas leak here. So, <laughs> 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 The um the other thing I'd recommend is the uh, Danish TV series The Rain, which is on Netflix, which is just really really um really good and and it's really well done um, post apocalyptic kind of thing that I recommend taking a look at. Um, uh, and those are the the two shows that I've been kind of like mainlining this week. So check them out. Thank you. He's on Hulu and The Rain is on Netflix. I mean, I, I've I didn't I never binged it. I never watched all of it. I've seen like three episodes of Community, and everyone was genius so obviously i need to i need to oh yeah yeah no it's, a, it's, uh, it's amazing it. i'm so glad that i started watching it and i just like i spent literally the entire day yesterday just watching the show and <laughs> like i would not be able to do that if my wife were here so yeah. thank you Angelica, for like being in in waka, in yes. waka so i can watch this show <laughs> uh tony what do you what do you got for us mm, i've got a couple of things. A, well, I haven't watched it yet, but there's a new Sentai Rangers show, a car Rangers that Shop Factory has. And I love, I love for that channel knows no bounds because I get to watch crazy stuff that I would have loved to watch as a kid. And I was never a American Power Rangers fan because I wanted to watch the Japanese one. Yeah. Not, that sounds maybe a little bit more pretentious than it's meant to be, but just I was old enough to know that I wanted to see the original. Like player. the uncut, uncensored. Like, yeah, yeah, I wanted to see that. Yeah. That has no bearing on quality or lack or whether it's good or bad on actual if you enjoy Power Rangers. That's not it. I just like that the insanity that's in the Sentai shows from Japan, which amps it. You know, same with Ultraman Leo, which I talked about. It's just like that would never the stuff that's in there would never fly in a kid's show. And that fascinates me, mm -hmm. um, you know, even if I am watching and I understand it's a show that's meant for like eight or 10 year olds. <laughs> like, that's just the way it is. Um, and then, oh man, I've been I, I again, I've been loving this rabbit hole of like random Amazon movies that have been suggested because we're covering all this Adam Age stuff. Um, my I have also a PSA uh, for people. Learn from my mistake. Uh, I had a hard drive die in my PlayStation 4. And what I didn't realize was you can avoid the pain that I'm having where I'm having to re-download all my stuff by just get go out now if you think you have everything covered and just get an external drive that plugs into your PlayStation 4 and keep all of your really long downloading like apps that you get because sometimes these games are like 30 gigs and then back up all of your save games to the cloud i tell you this because <laughs> i'm having luckily i had all the things on the cloud but i did not have everything else and all my settings and that kind of stuff so please oh please if you're also a pretty hardcore gamer like myself um please oh please just go get a drive i have one that's like i don't know they had a sale for like four terabyte drives and hook it externally that way if your internal drive goes south then you won't have to experience what i'm experiencing which is sucked <laughs> and oh and i have one music throwback uh a band that rain turned me on when we first met um i want to say probably 96 97 um called the god machine and they had two albums and some other recordings before their bassist passed away uh rapidly it was i think it was an aneurysm if i'm remembering correctly um and they broke up but man just revisiting their stuff every time i go back it's amazing amazing stuff so um i think you can probably find on youtube you definitely it's around. I haven't checked Spotify. Um, there's other bands called the God Machine, but you definitely, I don't know. They're, every time I revisit them, I get on a kick and I just listen to those two albums plus a bunch of covers and singles and stuff over and over. It's fantastic. That's really fantastic. Uh, gosh, okay, cool. Um, I... Really quickly, the first thing I want to mention is that, uh, yes, we're interviewing David about uh, Feathered Serpent, uh, Dark Heart of Sky, which is his book on on 
the myths of Mexico and, and you know, uh, pre-Mexico, Mexico. And that's on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, uh, I'm recording the first episode of the new California Tiki podcast. That is uh, a podcast inspired by and all around the same stuff that's in the book, California Tiki, that uh, Adam Foshko and I wrote. So we'll have an, we'll have an episode of that going up on, on Wednesday. So... Lots of podcast stuff this week, and um, the thing that I that I wanted to endorse uh, was Cobra Kai. I binge watched Cobra Kai. I didn't even. I try not to do too much binge watching, but I mean, I started watching this and I shot through all five hours of it like in no time. It um, was really surprising. I really want to see it. I'm so glad that you liked it. Yeah, it 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 surprised me a lot. There are so many ways you could take an idea like. Hey, let's get back to uh, Danny LaRusso and and Johnny Lawrence, you know, the the bully from his high school, and do a story about them thirty years later. Just imagine all the terrible ways that could go. The cheesy <laughs> over serious way or the stupid jokes that would turn it into something like a five hour uh, college humor video. None of that. It actually turned out to be a very thoughtful uh, show, essentially a five hour movie cut up and cut up into half hour episodes. Uh, it's, um, it's still a sports movie. It still delivers all the, all the sports movie kind of beats, but it is surprising and often leaves you unsure of who to identify with most. And you find yourself changing your allegiance, you know, from episode to episode, it's very skillfully done. And I was really impressed. If there is a new universe of reboots like this coming where the people are thinking this hard, uh, I I'm just so thrilled by it. I mean, I I don't know, I don't know what it, what else is going to come next. But uh, well, you know, I'd love to see something like that for Back to the Future. I'd love to see absolutely uh, a TV series that you know. Well, that, I mean, you know, comes forward into the present. We talked about uh, you know we we talked about Dark Shadows and what went wrong with that reboot, right? Yeah. Was that mm-hmm. it's it was it was silly, you know, and yeah, and it, it didn't. It wasn't respectful of the, it, to my mind, it wasn't respectful of, of the source material in, in the way that it needed to be. But anyway, that's, that's right. You know, and, and so that failed ultimately, which is funny because Tim Burton loved that source material so much, but somewhere along the way, Burton, I think seemed to think that we wouldn't. So he made a yeah. skit essentially. This is not that at all. This is like, we know that if you're tuning in, it's because you already have a deep love of Karate Kid. So we would never, we would never disrespect that. It's pretty darn good. Um, oh, oh, one more thing that I wanted to mention. I watched The Last Movie Star. And this is a movie that I had not heard about from anybody. Nobody mentioned this to me at all. But The Last Movie Star is a movie where Burt Reynolds essentially plays himself. And he is an aging 70s star who was in all the movies that Burt Reynolds was in, basically, because they have flashbacks and stuff. And he gets invited to a film festival to receive an award. But when he gets there, it's a crappy little film festival. He's upset. And... Uh, he goes on a road trip to go see the place where he used to play football and the, and the neighborhood where he grew up. And it is beautiful and poignant. And you also get to see uh, extremely old Burt Reynolds, uh, like talking to himself. So they do all these, all these, uh, you know, special effects where all of a sudden Burt Reynolds of 2018 is talking to Burt Reynolds from deliverance. And it, it's it's cool, I it. but I mean, I'm telling you this. Has anybody here heard of this movie? No, I just stumbled across it. <laughs> I I had heard of it, but I haven't I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, so that's my that's that's my my other recommendation is everybody's talking about Cobra Kai. Nobody's talking about the last movie star, but you should check it out. So anyway, um, gosh, what a fun conversation. Yeah, uh, you know, we had a bonus segment. It made us go long, but uh, but I really enjoyed it anyway. And 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 god knows we'll probably do more thank you guys for being on and for talking and 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 being such cool friends those of you who are listening uh you know join us on the facebook page and 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 we'll uh we'll see you there uh bye guys have a wonderful evening